Hello, everybody, and another welcome or welcome back to my podcast. As always, if you do like this, I do like to remind you to please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Okay, so before we get too far into this, I do want to apologize for not having a second episode up this week. I had planned on doing an episode on the Atlantic's piece on the sex recession, and that will be upcoming. You will have it in your ears on Tuesday, but it just didn't work out this past week. And so I just wanted to go ahead and apologize for that, but it is forthcoming. I have not forgotten. I know I mentioned it. It's coming. I promise. But I also wanted to go ahead and take this moment to say that because of the holiday season and because of my work schedule, um, I know everything's kind of a little bit off this week and probably will be off a little bit scheduling wise. I normally try to do Tuesdays and Fridays, but obviously with the upcoming Christmas and New Year's and everything, it's going to be a little, a little dicey as far as scheduling is concerned. I'm going to still do at least one episode a week. I'm going to try to do two a week, but between now and the new year, I can't really say that it's going to be my normal Tuesday, Friday schedule. So don't think that I've forgotten you. I have not abandoned you. It's just things are kind of weird and crazy with my schedule right now. So I wanted to go ahead and just go ahead and say that. And so having said that, let's go ahead and start getting into the news from this past week. So going back to a week ago, which this feels like it was a month ago at this point, but I, I promise you it was only a week ago. Um, Kevin Hart had been tapped to host the Oscars and he was very excited to host the Oscars. He had said it was one of his life's dreams to do it. He was very happy to do it. Everything was copacetic. Everything was cool. And then apparently, I'm not entirely sure who started this Twitter mob, but people went back into his old tweets and found tweets that contained somewhat homophobic material in them. And so as, as, as we do now, as, as we fucking do, everybody just swarmed on Kevin Hart. And originally Kevin was very much, I'm going to stand my ground. I'm not, I'm not caving to these people. You're going to have to fire me, whatever. Fuck all y'all, basically. But then the Academy came to him and said that, well, either you're going to have to delete the tweets or we're going to have to fire you. And so what sadly ended up happening is that Kevin Hart ended up, I mean, and this wasn't even like a 24-hour news cycle. Like, I don't even think it was a 12-hour news cycle between him basically saying, everybody can go fuck yourselves and I'm sorry for what I tweeted. But he did end up apologizing and he quit the Oscar hosting gig so as to not be, quote unquote, a distraction, which is, you know, the excuse that everybody uses now, whatever. Anyway, here's the problem with Kevin Hart's tweets. This was all stuff that was previously known to everybody. This was not new information. And moreover, this was something that Kevin Hart had already apologized for in the past and had actually publicly discussed where he was at when he made these tweets. And it was in the service of, and I'm not, I'm not saying Kevin was in the right for having this kind of mindset, but he was of the mindset that I mean, he has a son and he felt like if his son turned out to be homosexual, then he somehow failed as a parent. And that's what he was afraid of. Like he was, he was doing this out of a place of not wanting to feel like a failure as a parent and feeling like if his son turned out gay, he would be a failure as like a father, which I mean, obviously that's fucking stupid. I mean, you're, if you're gay, you're gay. Like there's nothing your parents can do to make you not gay or to make you gay. Like sexuality isn't a choice. It's something you're born with. So, I mean, he was not, right for feeling the way he felt and for thinking the things that he thought, but this was something that was already public knowledge and he had already publicly discussed and apologized for and said that he moved on from, but still, apparently that didn't fucking matter in 2018 that this was something that had already been discussed and apologized for. It was apparently something that he still had to pay for. Like it was some new information that nobody had. Like, can we please stop with this? Like, can we not? And 
what's bad is this isn't even like the worst of Twitter news this week, but it's just, it's so fucking stupid. Like everybody already knew about his tweets. Like this is not news. I don't understand why you have to be held accountable for something that you already apologized for. And honestly, it begs the question, what the fuck is the point in apologizing if it means nothing to the people that you're apologizing to? Like, why bother to humble yourself? Why bother to show contrition unless you want to do it for yourself? And I mean, that's that's a whole nother ball of wax right there. Like, if you want to apologize for something because you're genuinely sorry for what you said or for feeling the way that you felt about a certain situation and you're doing it for you, that's a, that's a different situation. But if you're doing it to try to appease other people, just know that apparently that doesn't work anymore. And even if you do apologize for something, you're still going to pay the price. So I can see this in the future, creating a backlash of people being held accountable for things that they said or things that they posted on social media or just what the fuck ever, you know, people say things in speeches, people say things on Facebook posts from, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. People tweet things when they're young and eventually like you grow, you change, you become a different person and you're still going to be held to that standard of who you were all those years ago. And you're going to be applied to 2018 standards and you're going to be judged lacking when there doesn't seem to be any acknowledgement that people grow and change. And that just because you felt a certain way five years ago doesn't necessarily mean you feel that way now. Like you could have done a complete 180. You could have doubled down. You could have done a plenty, lots of different things, like plenty of different things in the span of five years. So what I can see happening is this kind of culture of people not accepting apologies in the spirit in which they're given is going to create a group of people who are basically going to say, fuck you, I'm not apologizing. Even for things that they probably should apologize for and maybe even want to apologize for, but they're not going to because of the way that their apology is going to be received by the people that they're apologizing to. And to bring it back to the Oscar situation itself, as of this recording, they still do not have an Oscar host, which I posted up a, a, a poll on Twitter saying that which which position is going to be filled first, the Oscar host or the White House, White House chief of staff? Because it doesn't seem like anybody wants either role right now, which is kind of funny because both roles are prestigious, sought-after roles that have been completely fucking ruined by everybody surrounding the roles. It's it's kind of funny. Like, it's the, the White House situation is very funny, too, which... I'll, I'll go ahead and touch on that briefly. Um, John Kelly is retiring. I believe it's effective the end of the year or like the beginning of January. And it's been this, like everybody I can possibly think of names has been brought up. I've seen Chris Christie lately, um, Newt Gingrich this morning, um, Jared Kushner has been brought up. Um, I mean, just... Anybody you can think of, I'm still agitating for Scaramucci to get his job back because let's let's just bring that back. Like if this is going to be a shit show, let's make it a whole fucking shit show. Bring back the mooch. <laughs> his name has not been put in contention, sadly. But everybody's name who has been brought up to be the White House chief of staff, much like everybody whose name has been brought up to be the Oscar host, is like, no, 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 no. That's no, that's cool. Like, thanks, but no thanks. Like, that's. That's sweet, but no, no, I don't, I don't want that job. I don't want it, but that's, that's kind of what's going on with the Oscars and the White House. Both of them complete fucking dumpster fires right now. And nobody wants the main job as far as actually running either gig. It's funny, but anyway, moving on to the other Twitter outrage from this week and this one. This one bothers me. This really bothers me. And it involves Kyler Murphy. Now, I'll go ahead and back this up a little bit for those of you who aren't super sportsy. Kyler Murphy is this year's Heisman Trophy winner. And if you don't follow college football, allow me to explain. 
the Heisman Trophy is awarded every year to the player who is voted by sports writers, by former Heisman Trophy winners. Um, there's a now very recently kind of thing. When I say recently, like the past couple of years, there is like a fan voting block of this. But it, it's a award that is given every year based on voting to the player who is voted the best college football athlete of the year. It's a very, very big deal in college football to win the Heisman Trophy. Like, as far as your college football career, outside of actually winning a championship, it's the biggest thing you can do. Like, this is a massive deal. Like, it's the the award ceremony is televised. It's on ESPN. It's a huge fucking deal. Everybody shows up to it. It's like it's it's an award show at this point, honestly. And it's a huge honor to win this trophy. So... All that being said, this kid wins the trophy. Everything's good. Like, this is probably the best night of his life. Probably, at least as far as football is concerned. Like, this is, this is it. Like, this is, this is winning. It's like winning the MVP. Like, this is it. USA Today decided, and I'm pretty sure it was USA Today that ran the original article, but plenty of other outlets ran with it. Somebody went back in this kid's tweets, and now, mind you, we're talking about a teenager right now. We're talking about a 19-year-old kid. They went back and dug up tweets from when he was like 15 fucking years old of times when he called other people like a queer. Like, okay, what the fuck ever. But really? And the thing that kills me about this is that... This was not something that you could have possibly have done between like the span of time of him winning the trophy and then running the story. Like this is something that you had on deck. Like what the fuck? Like USA Today paid some staff writer to go through this kid's fucking tweets and find shit to to write a story about. Like, honestly, this this is what was considered a good use of time and money by USA Today to try to go back into a kid's tweets who has done fucking nothing to anybody other than win the Heisman Trophy and to try to tear him down from some tweets that he tweeted when he was fucking 15. Really? Really? What the hell is wrong with somebody who does that? Like, what what is broken inside of you? That you need to take somebody else's joy like that. Like, what the fuck, USA Today? Like, that just, that really pissed me off. And it's Because it's just so spiteful. And it's so petty. And it's so unnecessary. Like, there was nothing that this kid has ever done to necessitate being treated like that at all. It is a smear piece designed to try to take this kid down a couple of pegs on the biggest night of his life. Like, who are you? Who fucking does that? That's so insane. Like, in the fact that it wasn't, like, a Twitter mob, but it was an actual, like, newspaper, I guess you can call USA Today. I'm not quite sure what they are at this point. I'm pretty sure they still come out in print. Like, I'm I'm so old, I remember when, like, you could stay in a hotel and you got print copies of USA Today in front of your door. I don't know if they do that anymore, but an established news outlet decided to run a hit piece on a kid for no fucking good reason, just because. And because of some tweets he tweeted when he was 15 years old calling somebody a queer, which, I mean, okay, yes, it's a homophobic slur. Yes, and I should probably have mentioned this beforehand, but we are talking about a black kid. And not to say that what USA Today did was because he was a black kid, but in the black community, there is, it's, I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this without it sounding like horribly bad. Gayness is kind of a weird thing in the black community still, even today. And so calling somebody a queer when you're black, I mean, it is meant as an insult, but sometimes it's along the lines of like, like when New Yorkers call somebody a fag. Like it's it's still a homophobic slur, yes, but it's not meant 
in that way of being a homophobic slur. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like, language is kind of weird sometimes in the way you, you say things. It's kind of like, kind of like sometimes if you call a woman a bitch, you're not like trying to be like, you fucking bitch. You're just like, what's up, bitch? But it just, that bothered me because there was no reason for that. Like, that was just so fucking out of pocket and so uncalled for. And again, it's part of this stupid, stupid, stupid call out culture. And that's kind of a new phrase that I've learned, call out culture, because I've been reading Coddling of the American Mind and I'm, I'm still making my way through it. I'm trying to find time to finish it up and I will do a book review on it when I'm done. But it's this idea that anything, just like any fucking stupid little thing that possibly comes out of your mouth and even if you don't mean it in a way of being derogatory or trying to be insulting in that way, it gets taken in that way and people want to fucking drag you for it. And it's like, stop, just back up and realize that maybe there is a little bit of value in trying to be somewhat graceful towards people, especially for things that they said years and years and years ago, not shit that they said just right now in 2018, which brings us to our next topic. Oh, Mika Brzezinski, which if you don't know, Mika is Joe Scarborough's wife. They're on MSNBC. I saw somebody describe them this week as a Me Too moment gone right because there's there, there's a whole backstory on their relationship, but it's not really relevant to this. So anyway, Mika on live television on, I believe it was either Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. During, I'm not entirely sure what the context of the conversation was, but she referred to Mike Pompeo as a wannabe dictator's butt boy. Now, I'm sure you can all see the problem with that. I mean, calling somebody a butt boy, or calling somebody somebody's butt boy is kind of a homophobic slur. And the fact that she just busted that out on live television it's just like, what the fuck? Really? Okay. But what's interesting about Mika, as opposed to Kyler or to Kevin, is it's been fucking crickets. Like, everybody just said, like, oh, look, she said that. Oh, we're moving on. No outrage mob, no Twitter mob, nobody calling for her to be fired. Everybody just kept it moving right past Mika. And I'm sitting here like, Okay, so, and and not to say that either one of these situations is right, but Megyn Kelly basically got hounded out of her job for asking why white people can't perform in black blackface, which is a stupid question, no doubt. But Mika just called somebody a butt boy on live television, and apparently nobody had shit to say about it. Really? So, okay. So just as an example of how the outrage mob works and really what, what it is when the outrage mob swarms on someone, it's all dependent upon the person in question. Now, obviously, Mika, after her and Joe fucking like praised Trump to the goddamn rafters to the point where a lot of people, every time somebody brings this up, everybody wants to point out that on the Morning Joe show that, like, they fucking boosted Trump so much that people like to blame them for the reason that Trump got elected. It's kind of a meme. I mean, we don't really think that that's the reason, but it's funny to call them out on that. Because ever since Trump got elected, they've gone never Trump. And it's like, wait a minute, you guys, y'all put them on. But anyway, so now that they are never Trumpers, Apparently, I guess you can say homophobic slurs on live television and nobody calls you out on it because you have the right stance on Trump. Oh, okay, cool. So next time the outrage mob kind of gets wound up, start looking at who they're getting wound up against and remember the story of Mika. And remember that this is all incredibly selective. 
this is not applied to everybody. And certain people are most certainly excluded from the outrage mob treatment. But let's move on to a story that was not widely discussed this past week, except amongst certain areas of Twitter. And even there, it wasn't super widely discussed, except in that we all kind of had our fun with this one. And that is that I think it was definitely Kansas. I think the other state was Minnesota. Both states had cases that they were trying to bring before the Supreme Court where different groups or organizations were suing the states to try to make it to where Planned Parenthood would have to be included under Medicaid. So, like, they were trying to, and the states were trying to block Planned Parenthood funding for Medicaid, basically saying that if you're on Medicaid and you're going to Planned Parenthood, like, Medicaid doesn't have to pay for that. So, the Supreme Court shot down hearing either one of these two cases, and... A certain beer-loving, brand-shiny-new Supreme Court judge sided with the liberal side of the Supreme Court justices in saying that these are cases that should not be brought before the Supreme Court. And let me explain to you a little bit if you're not entirely sure about how the Supreme Court works. Basically, what happens is if you want to bring a case to the Supreme Court, you wind your way through your normal, your courts, your city courts, your state courts, typically go through the Ninth Circuit. And eventually, if you do not get the results you want, you you kind of apply, basically, to have your case heard by the Supreme Court. And so you you send in your brief, you send in your evidence, you send in everything, and then the justices sit down read it over, and then vote on whether or not they will hear your case. So it's not like something that's automatic. Like just because you petition the Supreme Court to hear your case does not necessarily mean they're going to automatically accept your case. And they are very, very choosy about what cases they pick to hear in any given session. Like they have hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people apply and maybe, maybe a dozen per session. And that is kind of a lot. So, yeah, that's how that works. And so Brett Kavanaugh, like I said, had voted with the more liberal justices in saying that these cases are not Supreme Court worthy. Now, what's interesting about that is that that brings up the fact that these are both cases that would be obviously about abortion. I mean, if we're being honest which would bring us onto the Roe v. Wade topic. And Kavanaugh voted to not even hear these cases. So you can see why nobody on the right or the left really wants to talk about this because this doesn't fit either one of their narratives. But this does touch on something that I discussed during the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearings. And that is this idea that his, his relationship with Roe v. Wade. Now he has said previously, and I pointed it out when I was discussing it during his confirmation hearings, he has said that he does not have any interest in overturning Roe v. Wade. Like, I don't know where this idea has come from that he did, but Obviously, he doesn't to the point where he's willing to vote to not even have cases that touch Roe v. Wade come before the court. So, um, it almost seems like some people's fears about Brett Kavanaugh might have been a little over-exaggerated, shall we say, and maybe overplayed to the point where it didn't really collide with reality. And now that reality is setting in, certain people don't want to talk about that anymore. But I still want to talk about it because like I said, during his confirmation hearings and, and I did, I actually did three, three fucking episodes on the confirmation hearing. That's how absolutely insane it was. Like, I think if I had to pick, in moment from 2018 that was the most batshit insane I think it would be the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings like that just 
that was over the top wild. Like I'd never seen some shit like that before in my life. And I was actually talking to my husband about it the other day. And I'm like, you realize we had a Supreme Court confirmation hearing where we talked about farting and beer. Like that, that happened. That fucking happened. And it was just like, oh my God. But that was, that was such a fucking circus. And obviously now that Kavanaugh is on the Supreme Court and he is kind of getting his sea legs and he is starting to hear cases and vote on them. A lot of the fears and possibly maybe a lot of the hopes about him might have been a little wildly overblown. So I just think it's it's funny and it is something that needs to be that have attention drawn to it in the way of kind of reminding us the next time this happens because I think I still think there will be a next time. Like I don't think I don't think Ginsburg's gonna make it. I don't think Breyer's gonna make it. And so I think we're going to get at least two more Supreme Court confirmation hearings. And I'm still saying that Trump's going to serve eight years. So God only knows how many justices he will put on the Supreme Court. But that will be the legacy. That will be the Trump presidency legacy is how many Supreme Court justices he puts on the bench. And I'm saying at this point, it's going to be at least four. So, yeah, we will be doing this again. And it will be a circus again. But just remember, just remember that circus. Remember the Kavanaugh circus the next time we do a confirmation hearing. And maybe stop to think that, you know what? This might all be bullshit. And everybody might need to sit down and shut up and look at the facts in front of them instead of LARPing and putting on red cloaks and making a big fucking example of themselves over nothing. Because apparently dude is not even remotely interested in touching Roe v. Wade. As he just proved by saying that, no, I don't even want to hear these cases, let alone discuss overturning Roe v. Wade. Like, okay, y'all were fucking dumb. And I'm going to call you out on it. You were fucking dumb. And yeah, that's about it for that. So let's go ahead and move on to the next dumbass thing from this week. Which is that for some reason, I'm still not understanding. I don't know why this keeps happening. But apparently, we needed to have another tech hearing in Congress. And this time, the CEO of Google was there. Which, as I noted in the when I discussed the last tech hearing, Google very conspicuously did not send anybody. And I applauded them for that. I still do. These hearings are fucking bullshit. I don't know why they keep happening. It's just, it's the dumbest fucking thing ever. It's a waste of everybody's time. And the only thing it proves is that, yes, Congress still is full of old people who have no fucking clue how the internet works. Like, it's just every time, like every time you have at least two or three people that want to be clown themselves by asking the most god-awful, stupid, dumb questions you could possibly think of and all it does is prove that you idiots have no idea how the internet or social media works and actually the best one the best one was from Steve King who told this story which I think is completely fucking made up but he told this story about how his niece was playing on an iPhone and she was playing some kind of game and some picture of him came up with something derogatory on it and mind you He's asking all this to the CEO of Google. He's asking the CEO of Google, how did this thing pop up on my niece's iPhone? And to his credit, the CEO of Google handled it way better than I would have because I would have laughed in dude's face. But he just pointed out like, I'm, I'm the CEO of Google. I don't, I, I don't know how iPhones work. Because that's fucking Apple and not Google. And of course, Steve King tried to save himself. Like, oh, well, maybe it was an Android. It's like, God damn it. If you're going to make up some stupid woke kid story, like at least get it right. But it's just like, it's, it's the stupidest thing. And somebody else asked, like, why is it if when I Google idiot, pictures of Donald Trump come up? Which, 
the answer to that question is pretty blatantly obvious to all of us. But it's like, if somebody somebody asked, like, when you do a Google search, like, is it like in like the algorithm? Like, is it just an algorithm, or is there like people, like people spitting you back, like search results? Like, what the fuck do they think Google is? Oz? Do they think there's a little man behind the curtain who just has said the beep, boop, beep, boop, beep? Okay, here you go. Like, what the fuck? Like, can we please stop with these tech hearings? It's blatantly clear that these people have no fucking clue how the internet works. And what is frightening is that inevitably, every time one of these tech hearings happens, these, these fucking idiots who clearly do not know how anything works keep wanting to advocate for government interference into the internet and into social media, which get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. No, Uh uh-uh. I am not here for any more stripping of Section 230. FOSTA was bad enough. That shit needs to be overturned. I am not here for any more infringements upon that, especially by people who don't know their ass from a hole in the ground about how the fucking internet works. Like, I swear to God, the only thing that these tech hearings do is prove how old Congress is. Like, y'all are old as fuck. You have interns do your Googling for you. I can tell. I can tell because you ask dumb questions about Google. So that happened. It remains to be seen what the fallout from that is going to be. Probably more tech hearings where we will probably all get to dunk on how old Congress is. For forever and ever, until they try to pass some kind of legislation, which, oh God, please, God, no. Like, it's, no, it's, it's going to be the death of all of us if these idiots decide that with their stupid non-grasp of how the internet works, that they can somehow regulate it. Like, just no. And I know we've already done this rant before, and I've already given my thoughts on Section 230, Obviously, I'm a huge supporter of it, but this is something to kind of keep your eye on because these idiots keep, these these tech hearings keep happening, which means these these morons are going to try to do some shit. So I'm keeping my eye on you, Congress. You're going to do something stupid. I'm going to be here to call you out on it. I'm watching you. But to move on from that to something I really want to talk about because this is a story that's getting the right press for all the wrong reasons. And that is, and of course, I will link it in the show notes, as I always do, um, my internet homegirl, Leah McSweeney. Hi, Leah, if you're listening to this. And Jacob Single wrote a piece for a tablet, which is an online magazine. It's technically a Jewish magazine, but whatever. Like, it's not, it's, anyway, who cares? Um, It's about the Women's March. And this piece is a long form ish piece. I think it's a 10,000 word piece, but it spills all the fucking tea on the women's March, like all the way back to the first time these women ever actually met in person, how, how this was all put together, who put who in touch with who, and just all the way from that, all the way to present day and just exposes all the fucking shadiness, the anti-Semitism, the sketchy financial situation, the sketchy tax situation, the sketchy shit that people did to one another within the movement to get them to like legally remove their rights to even use Women's March. And as far as that's concerned, what has been done to Women's March Inc. as far as turning it into this commodified thing to sell shit and it's just it's a fantastic piece it's it is long I will say that but I recommend everybody to read it because this whole movement was front to back sketchy and shady and gross as fuck and thank you to Leah and thank you to Jacob for making this piece and laying it all out there because this is just it's so it's it's bad it's really fucking horrible like this is this is not something that anybody should support. Like, not that I supported the Women's March before anyway, mainly because of the women who are heading it, but just, oh my God, it's, it's so, so, so bad. And so that piece dropped and it got like, 
you know, it it, it did kind of get some publicity, not as much as I personally would like to have seen it have gotten. Until, until this PR group called MP Strategies, which per their website, they do represent the Women's March, started sending out an email to journalists who post a lot on Twitter. And hold on, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to read the email to you because I need you to understand how fucking low down and sketchy this shit is. So hold on a second. Okay, sorry about that. I had to cue it up here. But here is the actual text of the email that was sent out en masse. Like, there is dozens and dozens and dozens of journalists who didn't even necessarily tweet about it per se, but retweeted other people's tweets, whatever. But this is the mass email that they sent out. Hi, insert journalist name here. We saw that you tweeted Tablet's article, re Women's March, linked here. Tablet is in the process of making several corrections to the story. Side note, they didn't make several corrections to the story. They made three, and they were minor at best. But anyway, back to the email. We have a list of fact checks we submitted to Tablet with corrections, including screenshots that challenge the accuracy of the story and the timeline included in the story. Okay. Fair enough. Here's where shit gets shady. Before we share the fact check, can you confirm that what I am sending you is off the record and will not be published? If you are interested in publishing any parts of the fact checks below, that you will contact us at first to secure our agreement. You will let us know if you intend to delete your tweet, pushing an article that includes sources slash allegations, which were not vetted properly and in line with journalistic ethics. Once I receive your reply, I'll send over the corrections. Please note that we are sending this to a number of reporters who shared this article. Okay. For those of you who aren't entirely aware of journalistic practices and ethical practices, this is fucked up. You do not send journalists an email like this ever under any fucking circumstances. You do not send journalists an email asking if you will delete a tweet. You do not ask them, oh, hey, Will you do this fact check with us off the record? Like, why the fuck would you even want that in the first place? You don't send an email to journalists asking, oh, will you get our agreement before you run a story on this? No, because every journalist is going to tell you to get bent and they're going to post this shit on Twitter, which is exactly what the fuck happened. Everybody screenshotted this and posted it up on Twitter and we're like, what the fuck is this? Like, what in the world? Like, everybody, every journalist who posted it up was like, I have never seen anything like this in my life. I've never gotten an email like this in my life. Like, this is insane. Not to mention, you want to send out an email calling out another journalist for not having properly vetted their sources and not having properly vetted their story, but you don't want to offer any kind of proof on the record? Go fuck yourself. Like, that is, this is... This is the dumbest, most insane thing I think I've ever seen anybody do. And this is a PR firm who's trying to do spin on this story. And what ended up happening, obviously, is everybody posted these screenshots that they got up on Twitter. Everybody kind of collaborated with everybody and saw that, oh, hey, I got that email too. And that became the story. Not so much the contents of the tablet piece, which again, go read it. But this, this horrible, horrible botched PR attempt to try to spin away this piece is that's, that's become the story. And of course, because that has happened now, the actual original tablet piece has gotten way more, way, way more coverage than it would have originally. Like more people have read it. It's not, the contents are still not being discussed, really, which that should really be the story, not the botched PR campaign, although the botched PR campaign kind of lends itself to the story that this is a group of people who have no idea what the fuck they're doing and are basically there to 
get their own money and get their own prestige and to get their own fame. But yeah, it's just like, it's the most, it, it's the stupidest unforced error I think I've ever seen in my entire life. And everybody needs to be talking about it because again, this is not some rando who the fuck ever. And by the way, in the original email, they never identified themselves as a PR camp or anybody who's representing the Women's March, which according to their website, like I said, they do, but they did not self-identify as that, which makes this even sketchier. Like, what the fuck? This is, this is just the most insane story. And I know it's kind of inside ball, but I think this is really a big deal because so much has been made about the Women's March and about how it's this, it's that, it's whatever. Like, no, you really need to know what these people are all about. But okay, deep breath. We need to move on from that because that's something I can really just spend like a whole hour in and of itself talking about. But moving on to the next situation that I want to talk about, and that is the potential government shutdown. Now, this has been kind of kind of a hilarious thing to follow over the past week. What is going on is obviously, once again, because nobody can pass like an actual fucking spending bill or an actual fucking budget, we have these little stopgap spending bills that get passed. So like every three months-ish or so, we have this same discussion about, oh, we're going to shut the government down if we don't get this, that, or the other. This time, it's wall funding. So Trump has made it very clear that he wants $6 billion for the wall. And Democrats are not willing to give him $6 billion for the wall. And so now we have both sides threatening a government shutdown. Like, Trump threatened to shut it down himself, which he can't do, but whatever. When In this insane, like, there was this weird, like, tableau set up for the press the other day that had Nancy Pelosi, Mike Pence, Donald Trump, and Chuck Schumer having this like debate. And it was just like, it was insane. I was like, what the fuck am I even watching? But the funniest part about it was that Pence was like, not wanting to even be in the room. Like it's so hilariously memeable when you look at his face compared to everybody else's. But anyway, so in that meeting, Trump threatens to shut the government down if he doesn't get his his wall money. And then Nancy government, uh, Nancy government, that that might be the best Freudian slip I think I've ever done. Nancy Pelosi <laughs> threatens to shut down the government to not give him his wall money. And so now we've got everybody threatening to shut down the government. So maybe the government will be shut down for Christmas. I don't fucking know. I guess we'll we'll discuss this next week because hopefully maybe we'll have a better idea of if the shutdown's going to happen. It seems like it would because obviously Democrats and Trump are never going to see eye to eye on wall spending. So, hey, if we shut down the whole government over wall spending, then okay, I get no wall. I get a government shutdown. Okay. This is I'm I'm okay with all this. This is fine. Everything's fine. This is good. But the one thing I do want to close out with, and I kind of, I kind of debated whether I wanted to talk about this because this is a story that just finally came to a head today. And that is the fact that the Weekly Standard will be closing down. Now, this has been kind of in the rumor mill for the past couple of weeks. People have been discussing it, but it did officially come out today. Like it is officially official. Their last edition will be on December 17th. And so, obviously, this is rather short notice for those who work for the Weekly Standard. And I'm not, I don't really have any love for the Weekly Standard or the Bill Crystal crowd or any of them over there. Like, the the Iraq war cheerleading is still a huge, massive sore spot for all of us libertarians, not to mention just all the war cheering out of the, the Bill Crystal Weekly Standard crowd, like all of it's just like, go the fuck away. Like, ugh, so, it's just so much damage has been done to conservatism. But anyway, my problem that I have with the Weekly Standard 
being shut down is not so much the what, but the why. And the why is not that their numbers have declined or anything like that. I mean, print circulation is down the way it is for pretty much every fucking publication. But online activity for the Weekly Standard ever since Trump has become president has increased because they pretty much position themselves as like the never Trumpers. Like they're, they're, that's like where the never Trumpers live. So traffic has increased. So I would assume revenue has increased. This is not a business decision on that level. It's not saying that, oh, the weekly standard is dead. So we're pulling the plug. They've actually been increasing in web revenue and web traffic and all of that. What happened was their parent company decided that they did not like the Never Trump tone. And their parent company also owns the Washington Examiner, which is a very pro-Trump, I guess, organization. Like, I don't know if they have a print or not. I, I think they might be going to a weekly print. I'm not entirely sure. Don't quote me on that. But this is basically their parent company deciding that We're going with the Washington Examiner over the Weekly Standard. They're not folding the Weekly Standard into the Washington Examiner. They're just axing it. And I guess going to take that subscriber base and try to move it over to the Examiner. (sighs) I know. I mean, obviously, I have a huge problem with that. I can disagree with what a publication has to say and also say that this isn't, this is very, very fucked up. Like, no publication deserves this. Like, just because you didn't appease your corporate overlords and you didn't strike the right tone and you didn't censor yourselves, that all of a sudden you get the axe. Like, that's... Anybody who feels a certain way about journalistic integrity and journalistic in- independence should not be okay with what is happening to the weekly standard. It's just, like I said, I don't like them, but this isn't right. Like this is not okay. Like nobody, no publication deserves this kind of treatment. And it's for fuck's sake, it's a week before Christmas people. Like really, you're really going to do this to people. Like just God damn, you know, but it does beg the argument here for why it is so important to support independent journalism and independent opinion versus having this kind of situation that the Weekly Standard is in where you're owned by a company or a corporation that can decide that because they don't like what you're saying and how you're saying it, they can just cut you off at the knees. Like, support your independent journalist, people. Support your independent... Support your independent journalists, support your independent podcasters, you know, pay for your subscriptions, go donate some money to the Reason Foundation, go actually pay for subscriptions to your podcast that you like, kick your people a couple money, a couple little bits of dollars on Patreon, you know, just keep independent journalism and independent opinion independent so that this doesn't have to happen to any of the platforms that you personally like. Like, that's what bothers me. Like, I would be heartbroken if this happened to, like, Reason or if this happened to any of the podcasts that I love. Like, if somebody just got shut down like that, like, I'd be heartbroken. Like, I'd be really sad and really pissed off on their behalf because, obviously, like, that's just, that's not what journalism is supposed to be about. Like, it's not about trumpeting what your corporate owners want you to say it's about presenting your opinions and your journalism in I mean at least as far as journalism trying to do it as unbiased as possible when you're doing opinion doing it as freely as possible and having the freedom to do that and I mean it costs money to run a publication it costs money to run a large podcast like all this costs money so just remember people it's it's the holiday season It's the giving season, so maybe just keep in mind 
what has happened to the poor people at the Weekly Standard. And, you know, send a little bit of love to your independent people so that they can stay independent. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. If you did make it this far, as always, thank you. And if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Take care and until next time.